everybody. Uh, I'm so pleased you're able to stay for this conversation. And, uh, we do have, uh, as I said, some experts. One of them is just taking a quick toilet break, so we'll give him a moment. But I'll introduce uh, our first panel member, Carla Scott, a stranger to most of you I know. Uh, I asked Scott to be on this panel particularly because um, of his connection uh, to a younger generation and uh, how they feel about God and how they think about God, which I think is distinct. And given that this movie uh, has been made in many ways to speak to uh, Scott's generation and uh, those close to it, I think his insights will be very interesting. Uh, the other person that we've invited is JD, uh, who should be here very shortly. And uh, JD, here he is. Come on up. Hey. Welcome, good to have you with us. JD uh, is an Old Testament scholar with the uh, School of Biblical Studies uh, here on the coast. And uh, so we're going to be looking to him to give us some help with uh, managing the Genesis story and uh, how the uh, director and writers have written it uh, today. I'm here representing, uh, I guess, many of you as a pastor, uh, but I'm also here because my training initially as a scientist, uh, my scientific training was as a microbiologist by a chemist, and uh, particular, with particular interest in genetics. So uh, this story has particular interest for me. Like all scientists, they also have to do uh, very rudimentary level geology and other such subjects. So where I can't answer questions, uh, I'm happy to take them on board and find answers for you. But, having said that, uh, I think it's really important to start off by saying that uh, this is not a Christian movie. <laughs> I see a lot of agreement. This is a movie written by storytellers. And they've written it to make a whole lot of money. And I think they've succeeded. Having said that, I think the really wonderful quality of this for us is that the people watching it, whether they're Christian or not, started a conversation for a lot of people about who God is, about the nature of God, about justice, uh, and in the face of wickedness. And even for a lot of people, uh, the future. How does God still relate to his people? So from this, for us as Christian people, comes a lot of conversation. Now, I don't know about you, but friends of mine and relatives who have seen it have already approached me for my thoughts and opinions on it. And I think it's really important for us as Christian people to be ready to have that conversation to not run away from it, nor to be of the angry variety. Oh, it's terrible. How outrageous. We are be ready, and this is what St. Paul said, he said, to give up reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And the timing of this, in some ways, is fantastic, because it's Easter. And what is the story of Easter? How through the righteousness of God, through God becoming human, all of humanity is saved those who turn to Christ and put their trust in him. So you can see the parallel immediately between the righteousness of one man, God started again, but through the righteousness of God made man, all things are set right. So on that note, what we're going to start with is to get the opinions of our panel, and then we're going to throw it open for question and answer, because I'm sure you have some questions, because there were some really interesting uh, takes on that uh, so JD, I, I guess what we're interested uh, to hear from you is, from a, an Old Testament scholar's perspective, how do you feel the storyteller uh, approached the Genesis story? Where do you see its uh, successes? Perhaps where do you see it went way out and left left us? So you can you make some comments for us? Well, first of all, my name is JD. I'm uh, I work at the School of Biblical Studies here in. Uh, I'm going to sit here in Lakeside, that's where I used to live before I came here, uh, here in Virginia. Um, and I would say that my takeaway from this movie, um, the one good thing that they got right, and that I think we get wrong a lot, especially as parents, I have four kids, um, is we like to put Noah on our on our kids' walls and the, you know, the line, the two by two and the Everything and what this movie that scripted, I think, well, was it is the biggest genocide to ever happen in all of humanity. God killed everybody except for Noah's family. Now, the intricacies of how that all works out, and there's no such thing as rock monsters, there's no such thing as God, or 
uh, in the story of uh, God wanting to kill, or Noah wanting to kill the people that, uh, or the, the two daughters, or the whatever. Um, there's a lot of fallacy that's in this, and like, so this is a this is this is a story. Um, but the thing, that, the, the thing when I hear this story, and the thing that opens it up for me, is the fact that we serve a just God. And when it means that we serve a just God, we can look at this story and we can see like, we're going to be faced with the question as believing Christians, and if you're not a believing Christian, my message for you today is, to just, just hear me out and hear me to the end. Our God, Yahweh, the three in one, Jesus, Holy Spirit, God the Father, they are a, God is a just God. And for God to wipe away all of humanity, that was a just and right thing to do because of the fall. Read Genesis 3. Because of the fall, there has to be, there, there has to be, there has to be justice because we serve a just God. Jesus is the wrath taker. Jesus is the wrath taker. If you want to look at anything in that movie, what happened to those people, how they died, how they drowned, how basically all of creation was killed, that's wrath. And that wrath will come, but it is Jesus that protects us from it. If you know Jesus, Jesus is inside your heart. You're protected from that wrath. But the gospel demands an answer. You either accept it or you deny it. Well, thanks, David. I appreciate you bringing that uh, clarity. I think uh, we all get a picture. But uh, given that most of this room, I think all of us want to look around uh, people that know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, I think we can safely assume that we are here for the grace of God. Praise the Lord. So, what about the way the story came to life? What things did storytelling pick up? It ripped you. It spoke in a way that interested you. What I found interesting actually was that they can never put God the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And what's interesting is that for the first ten generations after Adam, they didn't use a name for God. Um, the closest thing that we have came much later, which was Yahweh. But even that wasn't used to reference God. Um, so even calling God Creator, which they did in that movie, I don't think they would have even done that. Um, so I think that was a really interesting way of the storyteller finding a way to talk about. They also talked about him as him. Do you remember on? And his wife came out at one point and said, what did he say? It was an interesting one. He picked it up a second time. Yeah. Anything else that you picked up that was interesting? The storyteller had an amazing way of explaining how the animals were able to survive on the road, up in the ark, with all that they could find. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Because the story in Genesis doesn't actually tell us much about uh, how the animals lived or survived. I sort of came out with the question, you know, I've got a house full of teenagers. <laughs> and I, thought, I could just imagine me saying to Tom, right, oh, Tom, you're on poop duty today. And his job is to go around the yard and just keep going poop. Um, so it was an interesting way that the storyteller chose to deal with that, because that's certainly not in the Genesis story. Uh, but they put them asleep effectively. Well, I'm just wondering what it was. If they put them safely and tried the to the <laughs> yeah. oh, it the smoke. Yeah. Oh, it's something. It's smoke. 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 I 
right here too, okay? but, but that character seemed to represent the worst in humanity, didn't it? And of course, the mark of Cain, which was Cain and Abel, uh, went on for many, many centuries to represent this uh, stain on humanity. And so I think the storyteller, again, used Chibble Cain character to bring in other stories down the track back into the story. So yeah, very nice. I think that the fact that Chibble Cain got off the yard opened up a moment where you uh-huh. figured, well, the world hasn't been changed. Yeah. So yeah. all the problems would. And Noah got that, and he thought, 
and how can this perfect world continue through me because I am a horrible, horrible sinner. So without God speaking into that, I know if I was in another situation and I was faced with the biggest genocide in the world on my shoulders, or what I felt like was on my shoulders, without God saying, Scott, if you are redeemed, you are righteous. And I've probably been in a drunken stupor on the beach too, I think. Um, it's, a, it's a heavy situation. And I think you've highlighted one of the things that we, when we read that story, there's such a distance, isn't there? We're talking about thousands of years distance, but also the stories of personal character story. It's this distant story that happened long ago, and I think what Scott's doing is trying to bring it a bit closer, put yourself in Noah's shoes, and I wonder if we would be having the same crisis. In fact, I know people who have seen this movie and are having a crisis of faith right now. So that's why it's so important for us to know what was factual and true in the story, and what was the storyteller trying to get across their message.